Hey, Grace Kids, how are you? Do you know where I'm at? Well, I mean, normally we would do this on Sunday school, and I am recording this on Sunday school time, but we're not in Sunday school, but we are at the church. So if we're gonna have our Grace Kids lesson, we should probably go inside. You guys wanna go inside? Okay, this is what I want you to do. Those of you who are able, can you snap with me? Are you ready? One, two, three. Wait, did you guys snap? I'm stuck in a closet. Did you guys snap with me? Okay, let's try this again. One, two, three. Okay, now that's better. That's much better. Okay, guys, listen. I know it's been a while since we've gotten together for Grace Kids, and I'm not sure if you remember what we looked at last time. Do you guys remember? I think I heard some of you say it. We talked last time about Sheba's rebellion. And remember, Mr. Marcus talked to you about that. And there were actually a lot of kings that rebelled against David and against his throne. And some of that was the punishment for his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, that that sin caused a punishment that still remained. But as we see, the Lord continued to raise up mighty men to protect David and to protect his kingdom. And really, that's just a sign of the Lord keeping his promises that he had promised David. Remember, we've been memorizing that passage, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 through 17, that God promised to preserve the kingdom of David. And so even though all these rebellious kings rose up against him, God continually protected David. Now today, we're going to actually finish up our unit, our, our series of lessons on David. Now we'll have a review Sunday next Sunday, so don't go too crazy. But I want to look at the end of David's life today. Second Samuel chapters 22 to 24 really bring to a close the life of David. And in that, we see David's worship. I mean, almost all of these two chapters is a psalm, a song of David praising the Lord for taking care of him, for guarding his life. David's response to victory in battle was worship. David's response even to the end of his life was worship. David's worship was constant. And it's his worship that teaches us about God. And that's what I want us to really focus in on today. What does David's worship teach us about God? So if you have a Bible, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 22. We're going to spend most of our time in there. I'm not going to read the whole psalm because that would take us a long, long time. But I would encourage you, maybe read it with your family. Maybe get together with your family and read through these songs of David at the end of 2 Samuel and just realize that Daniel gives us a great example of how to worship the Lord and why we should worship the Lord. And I want you to realize that David's worship is focused on who God is and what God has done. And it's really amazing. First, we can see from David's worship that God is sovereign. Look with me, if you're following along, at 2 Samuel 22, I'm going to read verses 10 through 15, verses 10 through 15. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. And he rode on a cherub and flew, and he appeared on the wings of the wind. And he made darkness canopies around him, a mass of waters, thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him, coals, were, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning, and routed them. This is a really amazing passage as Daniel or David rather is using this poetic language to celebrate God giving him victory. And just notice that God is doing that by controlling all of his creation. He's able to move the clouds where he wants. He's able to descend upon the clouds. He's able to send out the lightning. Who can do that other than God? God created the heavens and the earth. We learned about that back when we were in Genesis, right? 
God created the heavens and the earth, and so he can control them. That's what it means to be sovereign. Because God created everything, he's in control of everything. And you know what, friends? He created you, and he created me. And that means he's in control of our lives. And that should bring us great joy and great comfort to know nothing that's happening is outside of God's control. The fact that we can only come together in a limited basis, and then I have to wear this silly mask when I'm around people, that's not outside of God's control. The fact that we have this amazing technology where I can record this lesson and then in just a few minutes I'm going to get to talk to you, that's part of God's grace. That's not outside of his control. Man didn't come up with that on his own. God is sovereign and nothing happens outside of his plans. Nothing in creation is outside of his control. Next, I want you to see that David's worship shows us that God is holy. God is holy. Look with me at chapter 22, verse 32. 22, 32. It says, For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock besides our God? This verse and so many other verses in Scripture show us the holiness of God. Show us that he is absolutely unique. There is no one like him. There is no one greater than him. There is no one even on his level. God, the triune God of Scripture, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one essence, is holy. There is none like him. None. The answer to those questions is obvious. None. Because God is holy. This passage goes on to tell us that God is just. That God is just. His judgment is righteous. Look with me at chapter 22, verses 24 and 25. It says, I was also blameless toward him, and I kept myself from iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness before his eyes. Here, David is rejoicing that the Lord has dealt with him justly. The Lord has dealt with him justly. David knew, and we learned about this a while back when we talked about his confession. David knew that his sins had been cleansed by faith. And therefore, when God looks down on him, he looks down on him and justly treats him as sinless because his sins were cleansed by faith. We also can see from David's life that when David did sin, the Lord brought rebuke. The Lord brought correction. And we can also see from David's life that those who have rebelled against God and refused to turn from their sin and faith get the Lord's punishment. All of those things show us that the Lord is just. When he judges, he judges in righteousness. And that is a reason to fear for those who have rejected him and a reason to rejoice for those who have trusted in him and had their sins forgiven. The Lord is just. Isn't that amazing, friends? Everybody in this world is talking about justice, right and wrong. But the true source of justice, the true measure of right and wrong, is the Lord, because he is just. Friends, children, let me encourage you. If you have never trusted in the Lord, trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are justly under condemnation for your sin, justly under God's wrath. But if you will trust in the Lord, if you will trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because he paid the penalty for your sin, you will justly be forgiven. You will justly and graciously and mercifully have the righteousness of Christ credited to your account. If you believe in Jesus, because God is just and because Jesus paid for sins for all those who believe in him, if you believe in him, God in his justice will look down on you and see the righteousness of Christ. It will be as, you have, as though you have lived Christ's perfect, sinless life. Let me encourage you to do that. Let me encourage you. Believe in Jesus Christ and have your sins forgiven 
have eternal life with him. One more thing I want you to see from God's, or from David's worship that hits on what I just said. David's worship shows us that God, and only God, brings salvation. Look at chapter 22, verse 36. You have also given me the shield of your salvation, and your help makes me great. David knows he didn't save himself. Not from the physical battles that he was facing from the other kings, and not from his own sin. But he knows that God is his salvation. That God is the only source of salvation. And friends, as I was just telling you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will have salvation. Let me encourage you also, there is no other way. There is no other way to salvation other than in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So again, I would implore you little ones, believe in Christ and have salvation. Believe in Christ and have eternal life. Believe in Christ and live. Friends, as David shows us, our only right and clear response to God, to a God who is sovereign, who rules over all his creation, to a God who is holy, to whom there is none to compare, to a God who is just and judges righteously, and to a God who alone brings salvation, our only right response is worship. Worship to him. So friends, let me encourage you. Worship the Lord in everything you do today. Worship him and him alone. Now, next week, we are going to do a review of all that we've studied in the life of David. So we're going to have a review Sunday next Tuesday. And I hope you're ready for that. But I want you to do one thing for me as you prepare for that. Can you do one thing for me? You'll have to ask your parents. You might need a little help. But here's what I want you to do. Next week, next Tuesday, I want you to dress up in a way that represents your favorite story from the life of David. Dress in a way, come up with a fun costume that represents your favorite story of David. Okay, can you do that? Ask your parents. I'm sure they will help you and help you find some creative things to do with things you have around the house. Grace Kids, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful that the Lord has provided technology where we can get together. We're going to have some discussion time after this. But I love you guys. I'm praying for you. I'll see you in just a minute.